Um, well, thank you, and thank you so much for the greater good for having me. Um, I feel so honored to be here to be sharing the stage with John Gabbardson. Uh, it makes me feel just really proud and happy to be here and grateful. So what I'm going to try to do in this talk is create some sort of framework to help us understand how mindfulness relates to compassion for self and others, um, and how the term mindfulness can be used in a couple different ways. And if we understand how it's being used, it helps us understand how mindfulness and compassion are both the same bird and are also at the same time two different wings of that bird. All right, so what is compassion? Um, John spoke about it very eloquently. Compassion is really concerned with the alleviation of suffering um, of all sentient beings, including oneself. So uh, self-compassion I don't see as any different from compassion for others. It just means we include ourselves in the circle of compassion. So um, from my point of view and my model, there are really three different components of compassion for both self and others. So the first component of compassion has to be mindfulness. In order for us to open our hearts in the face of suffering, we need to be mindfully aware that suffering, suffering is occurring, and we need to be able to turn toward it and be with it as it is. Otherwise, we can't embrace that suffering uh, in the arms of compassion. Um, Another essential component of compassion, of course, is kindness. You might say this is the most obvious or salient aspect of compassion. So that's treating ourselves and others with care, understanding, uh, and patience. But there's also a, an active element to compassion where you're concerned with the alleviation of suffering. There's also a motivation to do something about suffering. So compassion entails, or the kindness aspect of compassion, entails active, soothing, comforting, supporting. So when your friend comes to you and tells you a story of suffering, you might embrace your friend and give them a hug and try to make them um, know through your action that you care. Uh, when you see a homeless woman on the side of the road, uh, not only do you feel for her, but you might give her a sandwich or even just a kind smile to let her know that you're caring for her. And similarly with ourselves, when we see that we're suffering, we can do things to actively soothe and comfort ourselves for the fact that this moment is difficult. And then the third component, common humanity, okay, interconnectedness, interbeing. Um, oftentimes when suffering occurs, we, we feel separate from others. Uh, with compassion, we remember that this is part of the shared experience. And I really think this is what differentiates compassion from pity. Pity is feeling sorry for others or feeling sorry for ourselves. Compassion just says, this is the way things are. For all humans, we're all in the same boat. Okay. So what's the difference between compassion and mindfulness? Um, how are they the same? Are they the same thing? Are they slightly different? Well, it really depends on how you're using the term mindfulness. All right, so the most common definition of mindfulness that's used in the field is paying attention to our present moment experience with a sense of friendliness, acceptance, and non-judgment. And this definition was certainly, um, you know, John Kabat-Zinn really made this definition very popular when he first introduced the, the um, term mindfulness to the scientific community. But there's another way in which the term mindfulness is used, equally valid, but slightly different. Um, mindfulness is also sometimes used as an umbrella term for, you might say, the dharma, contemplative practice more generally, the path of awakening our, heart, awakening our hearts and minds. So um, I think it's important to understand these different ways in which the term mindfulness is used. I think when you think of mindfulness as an umbrella term, I call that mindfulness with the big M, the capital M. But there are also certain aspects to contemplative practice, to the process of awakening our heart and minds that are slightly different. And I think it's very useful to understand what these aspects are. And I'm going to talk about four. There, there are probably more. OK, so the first aspect of this larger umbrella term, mindfulness, is how we pay attention to the present moment noticing what's happening as it's happening. Uh, the second component is how we relate to the present moment. 
Can we relate to it without resistance, without aversion, with acceptance? So allow things to be as they are. And then the third component I would, oh, by the way, and I forgot before just to mention that the, the way mindfulness is commonly defined is a combination of M1 and M2, paying attention to the present moment without judgment. Um, another essential aspect of the broader mindfulness practice is compassion. And it's interesting, so compassion is aimed at the experiencer, not experience, the experiencer who is suffering. So for instance, we can be mindful of eating a raisin and do that in a non-judgmental way, but we probably aren't gonna have compassion for that raisin, right? So compassion requires a sentient being, and so it's really aimed at the level of concern with the suffering of that sentient being. Another really essential aspect of, you might say, the path of awakening is wisdom, and that's understanding the nature of both experience and the experiencer, understanding that our experience is impermanent, that it arises and passes away, understanding that as experiencers, we aren't nearly as separate and isolated as we, th as we think we are. We're really part of a larger interdependent whole. All right, you can see that these four aspects of mindfulness with the big N kind of cumulative, they build on each other, right? So you start with, you have to pay attention to the present moment, and the others kind of naturally unfold and build on that starting point. Okay, so having said that, I think it's important that we both focus on the big picture, the big M, um, if we want to awaken, open our hearts and minds, uh, reap the full benefits of contemplative practice, but it's also important to understand some of the differences between these different aspects of contemplative practice, both for purposes of research and also training, teaching this to, to people. All right. So in terms of understanding the differences for research, it's very important for a lot of reasons. Uh, for instance, self-report measures of these aspects of practice are often used to uh, measure what's occurring. And you wouldn't want to use the same measure for all four aspects of uh, mindfulness of the big N. Okay, so we need to be specific. There are also physiological and brain differences in these different aspects of contemplative practice. And we'll be hearing from Emiliana Simon Thomas about uh, this, as well as Paul Gilbert. So I'll let them speak to that. Um, I really want to talk a little more about how it's very useful to understand um, some of the differences between these aspects of contemplative practice for purposes of training, um, helping people cultivate uh, the, the awakened heart-mind. Okay. So one thing to note is that sometimes these various aspects of awakening spontaneously unfold, especially for long-term meditation practitioners. For, so for some people, just being with what is in the present moment creates a space for this friendly, non-judgmental awareness, opens the heart so it responds to suffering naturally with compassion and kindness, and also by paying attention to the present moment, uh, oftentimes wisdom naturally arises, understanding the nature of what's happening in our experience. But not always, okay? Sometimes um, we need a, li a little extra help to build certain muscles that may be not quite as strong as, as others. And in fact, if you look at certainly the Buddhist tradition, there are specific practices developed for each of these aspects of contemplative practice. So for instance, uh, concentration practices, coming back to the breath over and over again. It's very good for developing present moment awareness. Um, open field monitoring, where you're notice, noticing what's arising and passing away, not clinging or being attached to anything. It's very good practice for developing um, non-judgment, non-resistance to our experience. A loving kindness meditation, or the Tibetan practice of Tonglen, where you breathe in suffering and breathe out compassion, very good for cultivating the third element of compassion. And then, of course, wisdom is also essential. You know, why do we have Dharma teachers? Why do we have people like John Kabat-Zinn writing books? Why do we go to retreats? Um, partly because the larger wisdom component, it helps to have explicit training and understanding what's happening. And also, even within meditation practice, sometimes there will be insight practices like asking the question, who am I, who am I, who am I? And these are designed to cultivate the wisdom element. I would argue that perhaps the muscle that's the most atrophied of all these aspects 
is compassion for oneself, especially in our modern, competitive Western culture, very hard for people to have self-compassion for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes when we are young, we're uh, criticized by our caregivers, and we internalize the message that somehow we're deficient, we aren't good enough. But even if we had wonderful parents, our culture gives us the message that we aren't good enough. We have to you know, buy this product to be good enough, um, that we need to be self-critical and push ourselves to strive and to achieve. So I would say our culture doesn't really support self-compassion. And in fact, Paul Gilbert has done some wonderful work showing that oftentimes people are actually afraid to have self-compassion. They think they'll be too passive, or they think they really aren't deserving of compassion for themselves. So I really think that self-compassion is a realm in which some more explicit muscle building is very useful. Okay, so um, it's certainly the case that we know that mindfulness-based stress reduction and also mindfulness-based cognitive therapy do increase self-compassion. There's a lot of research to show that. And part of that is because when mindfulness is taught in these programs, it's really held in this warm, loving embrace. The teacher embodies feelings of compassion. They gently help people come back to the present moment. So it's kind of infused on the implicit level with compassion for oneself and for others. And in mindfulness-based stress reduction, sometimes it's, not, it's an optional um, thing, but sometimes people actually teach loving kindness meditation as one of the practices. But I do think it's fair to say that both of these programs focus primarily on developing the first two aspects, present moment awareness without judgment. Because, you know, you only got eight weeks. <laughs> And to, or, to really teach mindfulness well and deeply, you have to focus primarily, I would argue, on um, this aspect of contemplative practice. Uh, and it, you know, we don't really have time to go into each aspect separately. Um, but because of that, uh, my colleague Chris Germer and I thought it would also be very useful to develop a program that focuses much more explicitly on the development of self-compassion skills. So we've created a program called Mindful Self-Compassion, which we've modeled on MBSR. And our, you know, our dearest hope is that it can be seen as a sister program to MBSR. So it's an eight-week program. We meet for two and a half hours um, once a week. There's a half-day retreat. Uh, and we call it Mindful Self-Compassion because you have to have some foundation of mindfulness. You have to some ability to turn towards your suffering to open your heart in the face of that suffering. But in our eight-week program, we only devote one of our weeks to the explicit cultivation of mindfulness. The rest really is targeted on self-compassion. So we define self-compassion, we explain what it is, but also what it isn't, how it's not the same as self-esteem, how it's not the same as self-pity or self-indulgence, really important, how it's not going to undermine your motivation. We do have meditations like loving-kindness meditation, and um, we actually tailor that for the context of suffering. But we also do a lot of informal practices, like helping people remember to do something like when they're having a hard time, putting their hands on their heart, really soothing and comforting oneself and saying some phrases to help evoke, to remind oneself that what I need in this moment, in, the, in this difficult moment, is a little TLC, a little love, tenderness, and caring. Um, and it's this explicit focus appears to make a difference. Now, this is all very new research on the Mindful Self-Compassion Program, so please take this with a grain of salt. But we just published our first randomized controlled trial of the program compared to a weightless control group. And based on the effect size we got, it looks like our program raises self-compassion about two to three times more than mindfulness-based stress reduction based on the prior literature, and about four to five times more than mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Well, and it makes sense. If you spend eight weeks building a particular muscle, that muscle is going to get bigger. Um, I certainly know for a fact that our program does not do nearly as good a job as teaching the mindfulness muscle as um, other programs do. So in, explicit training, though, does make a difference. And also in terms of how long uh, the, the cultivation of self-compassion lasts, we really focus on providing people with tools, concrete tools, to use in their daily life so that after the warm glow of the teacher's embodiment of compassion fades, there's still something to fall back on. And in our research, we found that self-compassion gains were exactly the same one year later. Uh, life satisfaction actually increased. Um, 
the research, there's not been a lot of research on how long the gains um, associated with mindfulness-based stress reduction and uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, how long gains in self-compassion last, but it looks like it's more like two months and at a year the gains aren't there. Again, which makes sense. You need to have tools in your toolbox to keep going with the self-compassion practice. One uh, question that's very, been very interesting, for instance, uh, the UC San Diego Center for Mindfulness is teaching both the MBSR and the Mindful Self-Compassion program. And uh, a lot of people ask, well, which one should come first? If your ideal is that people take both programs, uh, which one should come first? I think for most people, getting a thorough grounding in mindfulness by taking a program like MBSR would be most helpful. You really need to embody your present moment experience, understand it, be able to be with it before um, learning how to be compassionate toward that experience more explicitly. For most people, but for some people, especially people who are very self-critical, maybe have a real sense of inadequacy and low self-worth, who once they sit on the cushion and try to be with their experience, all that comes up is this critical voice beating themselves on the head, some people might actually benefit a little bit from um, training in self-compassion before they're able to go deeper into a mindfulness practice. But we don't really know empirically you know, this answer to this question, so it'll be interesting to find out eventually. All right, so I want to talk about in our program, um, Mindful Self-Compassion, we actually talk explicitly about some of the differences between mindfulness, I'm talking about mindfulness in the more narrow term, paying attention to our present moment experience without judgment, and compassion. And the reason I think it's important to do that is because they actually create a bit of a paradox that can be a bit confusing if you aren't understanding what's going on. So with mindfulness, we fully accept the present moment as it is without resistance. Because since the present moment is all that exists, if we resist it, we're basically banging our head against a wall of reality. It doesn't work very well. But compassion, a lot of people say, well, is compassion passive? It's not, because compassion is concerned with the alleviation of suffering. So at the level of how we relate to the sentient being, the experiencer, ourself, in this case with self-compassion, there's the desire to alleviate that suffering. To, to help in any way one can so that future moments unfold in a way that will hopefully, not necessarily, but hopefully lead to the alleviation of suffering. So both have to be held in this, at the same time, and I think really the only way we can do that is by understanding that both have slightly different targets. And so um, because of this paradox, uh, one of the slogans of our program, which is very important, is that we give ourselves compassion not to feel better, but because we feel bad, all right? If you give yourself compassion to try to make the pain go away, that's just a slick new form of resistance, and you aren't really gonna get anywhere with that. But if you fully mindfully accept this is a moment of suffering, and you embrace that with compassion, I'm so sorry, dear, this is so hard for you. What can I do to help? How can I give you what you, what you need in this moment? Um, then you can both simultaneously accept your experience and do what you can to try to help it unfold in a more productive way. Uh, at the same time, what's interesting is that when you hold yourself in the warm embrace of self-compassion, what we find is it's easier to go more deeply into mindfulness because you feel safe, you feel held by your own loving kindness and loving awareness, and then you can really sink into the present moment. We've actually had quite a number of long-term MBSR teachers take our program, and a lot of them have commented that it is different. It makes a difference when you explicitly do something like put your hands on your heart and comfort and soothe yourself. The mindfulness can uh, often go much more, much more deep. So you might say that mindfulness and compassion, remember mindfulness but the small m, that they do this beautiful dance. They mutually support each other. They, they, they do the swirling, lovely uh, performance that really leads to optimal health and well-being. And so we can see the dance from a broader perspective as part of the process of awakening our hearts and minds, or a chitta, heart-mind, it can be the same thing, but you also can focus on the individual dancers. And in fact, if you want to learn how to do the dance, it's helpful to know the steps that each dancer is taking. Um, so although I think it's important that we hold both together at the same time, 
You know, in my very humble opinion, I think it can be a little confusing to use the term mindfulness to mean two different things, both as an umbrella term and as a specific term, especially for people who are new to meditation or maybe research scientists who don't have much of a meditation practice. I would be interested, in, just as there was a big um, conference coming up with a agreed upon definition of mindfulness, if we kind of come to some consensus about the larger umbrella term that's maybe other than mindfulness, it could be the Dharma, contemplative practice. Shana Shapiro has a, lo a lovely term, loving presence, so that we can uh, more uh, deeply understand how these things are held together, but also how they're separate. And that's it. Thank you.